So, less than 24 hours after we bomb an airfield in Syria, it's back up and running. Hey, poor! Hey, poor! Hey, poor! You don't have to be poor anymore! Jesus is here! The loudspeaker spoke up and said... Greetings, fellow worker slaves, podcasting at 128 kilobits from the Fortress of Squalitude, not far from the Redneck Mecca. This is the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast. I'm your host, Tucker. Professor Fuzznuts has curled up asleep in the bed, thankfully. Yes, it's a podcast hosted by a guy and his cat. Get over it. This is a news episode, and unfortunately, America will not be joining us as she is under the weather. She was going to try and be on the show, but she realized that she just couldn't do it after the various messages she was sending me all contained really, really bad typos of very simple words. And she's like, no, I am sick. I have to be in bed, which is fine. I would rather have her in bed getting better than trying to do a silly little podcast like this. So that does kind of make things a little awkward for me as I had planned to, you know, be doing this one with America. And, well, I unfortunately have uh, time constraints on me today because at work, they decided, oh, we're going to give you Good Friday off. And so you can get paid for Good Friday We're going to have you work 10 hours a day, Monday to Thursday. This means I have to get up at 3 o'clock in the goddamn morning. So, I got to go to bed real fucking early. And then get up at 3 o'clock in the goddamn morning and go to work. And uh, it also causes me the problem because... Normally, on my way in, I stop off across the street, get a cup of coffee, and my breakfast, and then I head into work. Cannot do that, because they will not be open at 4 a.m. when I'm leaving. So, I will have to make my everything up, my breakfast, my lunch, for the week, today. (laughs) <laughs> and hope that I can scam a few rides off of people from to get home from work so I'm not getting home at six o'clock in the evening. But hey, that's still better than when I was taking the bus because sometimes I wouldn't get home till seven or eight. Joy. And I have a uh, few things to go over before we get to the news. Uh, first, I need to thank uh, George for becoming a Patreon sponsor of the show. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, you guys have no idea how much your support helps me keep a fucking roof over my head. Um, literally. It really does. So, thank you, George, and to all the Patreon sponsors and the folks who've Helped out financially with the show over the years. Again, you you just have no idea how much it helps me. I also need to thank Alan for um, sending dozens of of news stories. And I don't necessarily use them, but I do like them, getting them, if for no other reason, than it often gives me context and shows me things that I would not have seen otherwise. Uh, and, and don't think that if I didn't use it, it's because I didn't like the story. It just may have been that it didn't fit into the time of the episode. And I know America is hugely appreciative of the stories as well. So, 
Thanks again. Now, um, I'm not entirely sure still what I'm going to do about the episode that would go up when I'm heading back from Reason Con. I do have a uh, Apocrypha episode in the can, but again, I don't want to necessarily subject everybody to three episodes of that in a month. And also, since America's not here now, I would kind of like to get her on this month um, at some point, if I can, you know, get have her on as much as possible, because uh, she is the brains of the outfit in many ways. Certainly the talent. So, but I, I haven't entirely... Like I said, I haven't entirely thought it out yet completely. What I may do, it all depends on, on things, is may, depending on how things are with America, may do a, a deep dive into a particular subject that we can record ahead of time. So it, it won't necessarily, it won't be out of date when we go, when it, when it gets posted. Whereas if, you know, we did a news story, news episode next weekend, put it in a can, and then posted it We, when I was coming back from Reason Con, the stories would all be out of date. You'd have heard of them. Or I might do... There's... I've had an idea for an episode that's been kind of rumbling around in my head, and I just haven't gotten around to working on it. Might do that. Like I said, it all just depends. It's, you know... <laughs> one of the big problems is, is that because I don't have a car, and it takes me an hour and a half to get to and from work, it's real difficult for me to plan anything. I just never know how much time I'm going to have available to me during the week. Because, hey, some days I actually do get a ride home, other days I don't. i am just got to play it by ear. I think that's everything, so let's get to the news. Everybody needs something to believe in, don't they, Reverend? Bow down thine ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Save him from this big mouth coos with a motor-driven ass who... Forgive me, Lord. I speak not in vain, but this little bitch provokes me so. Oh, Jesus. At least I can stay in character. This story comes from LiveScience.com. 28 new Dead Sea Scrolls fragments sold in the U.S. 28 fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls that were purchased from the Antiquities Market have yet to be published, but are now sitting in three U.S. institutions, Live Science has found. The forthcoming publications will describe some of these fragments within the next year. Experts said the 28 new fragments are part of a growing number of Dead Sea Scrolls that have appeared in the United States. At least 45 fragments of Dead Sea Scrolls have popped up in the U.S. over the past two decades. Scholars have questioned whether some of these fragments are modern-day forgeries or if they come from caves in the Judean desert that were looted in the past few decades. Often, anonymous individuals sold these fragments that have appeared in the U.S. claiming that they were once owned by Khalil Iskander Shaheen, an antiquities dealer in Bethlehem in the West Bank. Life Science found Shaheen collected many of the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Bedouin people in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. He often went by the name Kando, which his son, William Kando, now uses. However, William Kando has raised concerns about the number of scroll pieces claimed to have shown up in the U.S., In conversations with Live Science, he said that while his family has sold some squirrel fragments to collectors in the United States over the past few decades, the family didn't sell them in the numbers that some collectors are claiming. Now, according to the article, the fragments that have been found aren't unknown works. So... And they all seem to be from works that were are currently found in the Bible. So they're not as historically important as, say, an undiscovered gospel or an undiscovered Old Testament work. But they do have some merit because oftentimes the wording in them is slightly or even sometimes significantly different than in the versions we have today. Also, if they predate anything that 
we have that gives us a better idea of when these stories were first written down. So it's interesting, but not not earth-shaking news. This story comes from the telegraph.co.uk. Le privilege du blanc. How Pope Francis has relaxed the strict dress code once adhered to by the Queen Michelle Obama and more. Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, met the Pope yesterday wearing a pale gold dress and coat by one of her favorite British labels, Anna Valentine. Admitting headwear, her look defied all Vatican dress codes. But it wasn't a faux pas, as the modern Pope Francis had welcomed the look. Things have become more relaxed over the last few years. There are no hard and fast rules, a spokesperson for the Vatican explained. When the Duchess met Pope Benedict XVI in 2009, however, it was a different story. Camilla wore a customary black dress with long sleeves and a lace mantilla or veil or fucking burka. Let's just call it that. As has been the dress code observed by women for centuries when meeting His Holiness. White dresses in the past have been permitted only for a handful of queens and princesses from Catholic regions. When Princess Charlene of Monaco met Pope Francis last January, she adhered to the privilege du blanc, or the privilege of the white rule, wearing a chic crepe jacket and white driving gloves with her white mantilla and nude heels. The only color in her ensemble being a slick of red lipstick. Now, and, and, you know, this is a story I wish America was here for because as a male, you know, I, I'm not subjected to these things. You know, you look at the photos in the article and you got um, Prince Charles there in a suit and tie and he looks like any other businessman. And then you've got Camilla wearing her outfit, but it's like, really? In the 21st fucking century, women had to meet a specific dress code for the Pope that required them to have a their face hidden? I mean, what the fuck? Really? What the fuck? I, I, I cannot fathom why they would still think that was necessary. You know, I mean, it's Pope Frankie gonna rape the queen because he sees her eyeballs or something, her exposed face, the little rouge she puts on her cheeks. He just can't handle himself. And he's gonna forego decades of celibacy to hump some little old lady. Uh, Jesus. I, I, and I've never even heard of this before until now. I can't, I haven't even seen until this article, I never even saw photos like Michelle Obama or any other woman meeting a pope. So I had no idea. And I have to wonder if it's just something I didn't see because I really didn't, don't care too much about the pope or if the media didn't show those photos to, uh, you know, kind of keep it on the down low that, uh, women are treated less than equals by the Catholic Church. I mean, gosh, who would have thought that, you know? But it's just insane. And, you know, I can, I can under, say, I can understand requiring, you know, a professional outfit to meet the Pope. You don't want, yeah, you don't want a world leader showing up and shaking hands with the Pope wearing you know, a t-shirt and pair of blue jeans, but re- saying women can't wear white or that they have to wear only black and they have to keep their face covered with a veil. That's, that's ridiculous. Wonder one, one wonders what would have happened if Hillary had won and shown up in a pantsuit to meet Pope Frankie. Uh, okay. This next story comes from timesofindia.com. We will behead those who oppose the construction of Ron Temple, says BJP. I don't know what that is. Iderabad MLA 
Raja Singh. The chorus for building a Ram temple is growing within the BJP as more and more outrageous public utterances by party workers suggest. The latest such utterance today come, came from Raja Singh. Raja Singh, a BJP legislator from Hyderabad. He went so far as to suggest the beheading of those opposed to building a Ram temple on the disputed Ayodhya site where Hindu nationalists destroyed the Babri Masjid in 1992, ANI reported. To those of you who warn of dire consequences if Ram Mandir is built, we were waiting for you to say this so we can behead you, said Singh. The MLA has made similar comments before. In December 2015, he threatened a lynching similar to that of Muhammad Akhlaq in Didri near Noida in September 2015. He said he and his like-minded colleagues were ready to kill to protect cows. Akhlaq was killed by a ghoulish mob that suspected he had stored beef in his house. He had. We warned them against a Dadri-like incident in Telangana, we can both give our lives and take life for sake for the sake of protecting the cow, he said back then. So, obviously, beheadings aren't just for Muslim extremists anymore. Uh, I mean, here you have a guy who's a Hindu who is advocating for killing people because they don't share his religious beliefs. Or they don't think that he should be allowed to build a temple where he wants to build it. Come see the violence inherent in the system. This is what religion does to people, regardless of the religion. Lots of people tend to think of the Hindus as, oh, a quiet, peaceful people, and they, you know, they fold their hands together and bow and do yoga and contemplate the meaning of the universe. Yeah, some of them do. Others of them are like this asshole. And it's all because of religion. Not simply the type of religion he practices, but the fact that he is religious. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Asps. Very dangerous. You go first. This comes from LiveScience.com. Wealthy Roman settlement discovered beneath Britain's longest road. Construction work to upgrade Britain's longest road into a major highway has revealed a treasure trove of rare artifacts from one of the earliest and wealthiest Roman settlements in the country. The findings include ancient shoes, cups, a rare silver ring, keys, a high-relief glass bowl, and an elaborately carved amber figurine. Argue. Archaeologists with the public group Historic England announced yesterday, April 6th, archaeologists discovered the artifacts in North Yorkshire along the A1. Wow, you named a highway after a steak sauce? Is that like, uh, you know, how you funded it? You got the, the, the steak sauce to sponsor the road? Which stretches 410 miles from London to Edinburgh, Scotland, during a major project to improve the existing roadway. It is fascinating to discover that nearly 2,000 years ago, the Romans were using the A1 route as a major road of strategic importance and using the very latest technological innovations from that period to construct the original road, Tom Howard, project manager at the government agency Highways England, said in a statement. Now, things like this always have me, you know, kind of curious because... I know in the past it's been shown that ancient settlements and modern cities all tend to overlap, even if there are long periods of time where nobody's lived in that particular area. It, it seems that even in the 21st century, the natural features which inspire somebody to live in an area are no different than those that inspired people to live in that area thousands of years ago. And 
I know, like, in Greece, when they did the Olympics and they dug up, they were digging up all the stuff to build the Olympic stadiums, et cetera, et cetera. They found all these ancient artifacts and they put them all in display in the subways and things like that for people to see. I wonder how much of this stuff they're going to leave in, you know, along that area. And if they're going to be able to do something that gives an actual view of what that would have looked like when it was in use in an operation by the Romans. And the article goes on to say that they found enough artifacts to indicate that the people who lived in that area were highly literate. There were a lot of pens and inkwells that they dug up. So, definitely not the poor folks. Next story comes from independent.co.uk. 14,000-year-old village discovered in Canada, one of the oldest settlements ever found in North America. An ancient village believed to be one of the oldest human settlements ever found in North America has been discovered during an excavation on a remote British on a remote island in British Columbia. The village, which is estimated to be 14,000 years old, has been found on a rocky spit on Tricket Island, about 500 kilometers northwest of Victoria, Canada. It is estimated that the village is older than Egypt's pyramids. Scientists said the artifacts being unearthed include tools for lighting fires, fish hooks, and spears dating back to the Ice Age, or painting a picture of how civilization began in North America. CTV Vancouver Island News reports. Alicia Guavro, I guess that's how it's pronounced, an anthropology PhD student at the University of Victoria and a researcher at the Hakai Institute, which supports the archaeological team, took part in the excavation work. She told the Canadian television network, I remember when we get the dates back and we all just sat, just kind of sat there going, holy moly, this is old. What is, what this is doing what this is doing is just changing our idea of the way in which North America was first peopled. Now, uh, the, the article talks about the fact that there are oral legends surviving among the, uh, can't call them Native Americans because they're Canadian. Uh, <laughs> what do they call it? First Nation is, I think is what they call, they refer to them in Canada. There are oral legends amongst them about these villages that they are now just now digging up. And they're surprised that those legends could have lasted 14,000 years. Which I am too. Although I have heard, I've never been able to pin it down, that there are legends among the First Nations and Native Americans of them hunting woolly mammoths 40,000 years ago or so. And it's possible, since this island is in the western part of Canada, and the last known outpost of woolly mammoths is in a Siberian island, there, you know, there may have been woolly mammoths on this island at some point, and these people may have hunted it. Interesting to find out, since the woolly mammoths generally died out, not generally, but they had a massive die-off around 12,000 years ago, and then the last of them died out about 4,000 years ago on the island off of Siberia. But the um, supposedly some of the oral legends of the uh, Aborigines in Australia go back 60,000 years almost. I don't no idea how true it is and no idea how well they would compare with the original versions of those tales, but certainly it seems possible that elements could of, of the original tales could survive to modern day. This next story comes from smithsonianmag.com New Pyramid Discovered in Egypt After thousands of years, researchers are still making incredible finds in Egypt. Case in point, the giant statue unearthed in Cairo last month. Now, researchers have made another big find. 
Earlier this week, the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities announced that a team of their archaeologists discovered the remains of a pyramid dating back to the 13th dynasty, which ruled about 3,700 years ago. Roughly the time the woolly mammoths died out, folks, reports the Associated Press. The only problem is that an inscription indicates that the pyramid may have been built for a ruler that already has a pyramid next door. The Egypt Independent reports that the remains were uncovered at the Dashur Necropolis, an area about 25 miles south of Cairo on the west bank of the Nile. That area is home to what is considered to be some of the earliest pyramids, including Seneferu's Bent Pyramid and Red Pyramid. While the pyramid-shaped upper section is gone, the substructure remains. The uncovered remains of the pyramid represents a part of its inner structure, which is composed of a corridor leading to the inner side of a pyramid and a hall, which leads to a southern ramp and a room to the western end. A Del Okasha, the director general of the Dashur Necropolis, says in a statement, reports Owen Jarus at Live Science. Now, how it got to have the same name on it as another pyramid, they're not really certain. They think, however, that the um, survive the whoever was supposed to be entombed in the surviving pyramid had the name of the inhabitant of the one they just found obliterated and replaced with his own name because that ruler was unpopular for some reason. It's sort of like when King Tut's tomb was discovered. Everybody was shocked because they had never even heard of him. And they couldn't figure out what had happened. And it turned out that his successor had gone through and had Tut's name obliterated from everything that they, you know, that they, that could be found. And some years after Tut's tomb was discovered, somebody found at the, like the very top of a column in another part of the city, one mention of King Tut's name being carved. And apparently what had happened was Tut's successors had you know, the, the workers he'd hired to wipe out Tut's, the record of King Tut missed that one spot, and it remained there for millennia. So, that's it's still pretty cool, and they don't know very much about the pyramid yet. Uh, you know, according to the article, they ha- there's some writing in there, but they haven't gotten it all translated yet. The, their, the parts that they have translated seem to be a religious text. The article didn't really say what kind of religious text it was, but kind of interesting. All systems go! Prepare for countdown! 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1! Let's go to adventure in the amazing year 400 billion! With Commander Horton and playful companion Jeanette Sidney! As they roam the endless uncharted regions of space and be so fantastic they level the imagination! This story comes from Space.com. SpaceX gaining substantial cost savings from reused Falcon 9. SpaceX saw significant cost savings by reusing a Falcon 9 first stage in a launch last week, a key factor for the economic viability of reusable launch vehicles. SpaceX President Gwen Shotwell, which is a great name for somebody who works for a rocket company, Shotwell, speaking at the 33rd Space Symposium here April 5th, said the company expects to see greater cost savings on future launches of reused Falcon 9 vehicles as the company reduces the amount of refurbishment work it does on the recovered stages. Shotwell did not give a specific figure for the cost of refurbishing a Falcon 9 for a stage that first flew on an April 2016 launch of a Dragon cargo spacecraft, so it launched the SES-10 communications satellite March 30. It was substantially less than half the cost of a new first stage, she said. That cost savings, she said, came even though SpaceX did extensive work to examine and refurbish the stage. We did way more on this one than we're doing on future ones, of course, she said. 
The company's long-term goal for the first stage refurbishment is to turn the stage around within 24 hours for another launch. Looking forward to reusability, we don't believe it really, really counts unless you can turn it around rapidly or almost as rapidly as you turn around an aircraft, she said. Our challenge right now is to refly a rocket within 24 hours. That's when we'll really feel like we've got reusability right. The rapid and low-cost turnaround is critical as SpaceX seeks to recoup the large investment it has made in reusability. At a press conference after the March 30th SES-10 launch, SpaceX chief executive Elon Musk estimated, estimated, estimated the company had spent at least $1 billion on reusable launch vehicle technologies to date. We do have to figure out some way to pay off the development costs of reusability, he said, noting that the company was still working to determine how much of a discount to offer for missions using a flight-proven stage. The price savings can't be as much as the cost savings because we need to repay the massive development costs. In addition to reusing the first stage, SpaceX is also attempting to recover and eventually refly the payload ferry. Musk revealed at the 30, at the March 30 briefing that the company made its first attempt to recover the two halves of the payload fairing used on the SES 10 mission, recovering at least one of the two sections. So, and I, and I said in the past, Musk obviously is a big fan of the, uh, what is it? What is it? Um, the, the, the article that says a rocket a day keeps the high cost away. So, He's trying to push for as many, you know, as a short a turnaround as possible because that helps you cut your costs for reasons that article goes into great details about. Whether or not he'll be able to do it remains to be seen. I started out when SpaceX began launching being a bit of a doubter. However, I it does seem that Musk has an awful lot of good ideas. The interesting thing to see will be if they can make it financially viable in the near term. They're still, if my, if I'm not mistaken, they're still operating at a loss. Or if they're not operating at a loss, they're doing like what Tesla does and they're using some uh, creative accounting to put it politely, uh, to give themselves a profit. Um, Tesla, one of the reasons that Tesla has been able to turn a profit is they've, because they are electric cars, they get a carbon credit from the government, and which they can turn around and sell to other companies to help them qualify for, you know, lower emissions, even though they haven't done the necessary work. I think think the last time Tesla sold theirs, they got like $450 million. It was not a small chunk of change, and that was the bulk of where their profits came from. So, uh, you know, and I'm not you know, denigrating what Musk is attempting to do. I mean, if it gets us where we need to be, and you know, then, then I'm fine with it, but if it, you know, if it all implodes like the th- fucking housing market, well, then he's a dumbass, but it, I suspect that if this does implode, it'll be like the dot-com bubble when it burst, and that all of a sudden there was all this cheap fiber optic cable that had already been installed in a lot of places that enabled everybody to get faster speeds at a much lower cost than they would have. But we will have to see. T. L. Gray hot. This story comes from fastcompany.com. This father 3D printed a bionic arm for his infant son, and now other kids can have one. When Ben Ryan found out his newborn son couldn't get a functional prosthetic until he was three, he started Ambionics to build them. When Ben Ryan's son, Sol, was born, an injury during delivery led to a blood clot in his arm, and at the age of 10 days, the arm had to be amputated. After Sol left the hospital, the new parents learned that he couldn't get a prosthetic until he was a year old, and that he probably couldn't get one that would let him grab grab or hold anything until he was three. 
Ryan decided to find a better solution, realizing that infants could use a prosthetic at an earlier age, they might be more likely to keep using it as a toddler. If you don't get function before the age of two, there's a high risk that kids will just reject prosthetics altogether. He says, there's a really rapid period of brain growth that ends at about the age of two and a half. If you haven't mastered prosthetic use by the age of two and a half, I believe that's why rejection occurs. Existing prosthetics that can move don't work well for babies. Arms that use sensors have strong batteries and motors that pose a risk of injury. And the sensors, which have to detect a nerve signal, often can't work through baby fat. Another type of prosthetic, a body-powered hook, is cumbersome and unnatural looking. And the guy who, who's building this is all self-taught on how to do it and design it. He's used uh, for the, the um, you know, to, to get the hand to move and work, he used a hydraulic system. And it doesn't give any description in the article as to the exact nature of how that works. But that's still a pretty cool idea. Now, the interesting thing is, is if, depending on, on how the, you know, the kid learns to use that prosthetic hand, it may mean that he can't use an, a regular prosthetic when he gets older because the control system for it will be so different that it'd be like relearning the whole process over again and it would be much easier just to, you know, adapt the arm technology that he had been using for a modern one. Now, and the arm is, it, you know, the kid looks a little bit like a Popeye with a stormtrooper glove on one hand. Oh, <laughs> that's the way it looks in the photographs. Uh, so it's, it, you know, they didn't make any effort to give it flesh color or anything like that. And it's actually a two-toned plastic. I suspect the fingers, because they're the part that's a different color in the palm, I suspect they're probably coated with rubber to give it a better gripping action. Uh, and they have a, you know, they have a photos with a kid with the arm on, but they don't really show him using it. But still, anything that, that, you know, helps him lead a more normal life is pretty fucking cool. And the fact that some guy could just sit down get free software off the internet, get free training off the internet on how to use that software, then go to a place where he could use an inexpensive 3D printer to produce the thing, is fucking awesome. I mean, we are really racing towards the future here, I think. This story comes from gizmodo.com and this is another one I kind of wish America was here for. Scientists found a good use for surplus sperm. A team of German scientists were wondering how to deliver medications into the female reproductive tract and realized, hey, why come up with something new? The human body also already produces its own little machines perfectly suited to deliver to the, the goods to that same spot. So why not tame our little sex swimmers as a means of treating disease? by strapping little hats onto them. Medical semen. There are a lot of challenges to properly treating cancers or other diseases. Delivery systems need to actually target specific locations, control how the drugs are released, and kill only the targets they're aiming for, be they pathogens or cancer cells. Scientists have already been looking at some other cells, white blood cells for cancer treatments, or red blood cells for delivering drugs in the blood, for example, according to a new paper published last month on the RXIV, ARXIV, RXIV, I have no idea. Since they're really good at getting around the female reproductive tract, the researchers decided to try sperm cells, or as the paper's authors hilariously call them, sperms. Well, this isn't the first time the researchers have tried to strap a motor to a sperm cell. They seem to be the only ones I could find doing this sort of work, and this motor is all new. In order to test it out, the researchers created five micrometer-wide four-pronged hats laced with iron 
that burn, that bull sperm cells swim into and then push around with their long tails. When the sperm and hat setup hits a cluster of cancer cells, the hat opens up like a blooming onion. The sperm's head pushes through and it delivers whatever medication it was carrying. The metal in the microstructure allowed the researchers to guide the whole thing with magnets. The team did some tests and were able to move the sperms around tracks. They even loaded the little dudes with a chemotherapy medication, doxorubicin, a drug that has a strong effect on cancer cells, but almost none on sperm cells. When the drug-soaked sperm attacks some test cancer cells with the new sperm machines, the drugs started kicking in after two days. Now, of course, this was all done in a lab in a Petri dish and not in a human body, and it, the paper has yet to be peer-reviewed, so this may all turn out to just be a fraud. But it is kind of neat and kind of funny. You have to admit that. This story comes from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Digital redlining, how major American communication companies are controlling who gets broadband access or not. The good news, your daughter's school has been designated an Apple Distinguished School, and as such, she and all her peers will receive brand new iPads for their individual usage. The bad news, once your daughter leaves her school, she can't use it, at least not at home. For you live in a lower-income neighborhood without access to internet or a fast enough connection to take advantage of her shiny new toy. And given that her scholastic success is intimately tied to this new technology, your daughter is now at a clear disadvantage to her peers in terms of homework, research, engagement, and general knowledge. Not good at all. A 2016 Center for Public Integrity investigation revealed that across the nation, communities with medium household incomes below $34,000 are five times more likely not to have access to broadband than households in areas with a median income above $80,000. This means that over 30 million Americans, uh, the majority of them in areas with a medium household income below $47,000 a year, don't have access to broadband. Such stark disparities equate to a second-class experience where common applications like streaming video, graphics, and downloading larger files, as well as online job applications, research, and banking functions are either compromised or negated. This skewed process is known as digital redlining, involves discrimination against black and lower-income communities in the offering of broadband or upgraded services. I don't know if it is a racial issue or a profit issues, but either way, it's a problem that has to be solved, says Angela Seifer, director of the nonprofit National Digital Inclusion Alliance. She doesn't spend much time theorizing over the incentive for a major communication carrier to not offer their full services to lower income communities. What we see is them not investing in those poorer neighborhoods, she said, and regardless of what is causing it, it cannot continue. Last month, her alliance released its own report with a data mapping analysis of Federal Communications Commission broadband availability that strongly suggests that AT&T has systematically discriminated against lower-income Cleveland neighborhoods and its deployment of home internet and video technologies over the past decade. Now... I know this is in the science section, and it is somewhat political, but that just this just seemed to be the best place to stick this story. I will have to point out that Trump just cut, or is planning to cut, whenever the budget can get through Congress in whatever form, um, the government subsidies that help get low-income groups broadband access. And we, you know, you have groups like AT&T, Comcast, Cox, et cetera, et cetera, actively working against things that would allow for expanded broadband access for everybody. For example, in the state of Tennessee, it is now illegal for a municipality, you know, a city, to offer any kind of Internet access that isn't provided by somebody like Comcast or whomever. Because a lot of cities in Tennessee and other states were all upset with the shitty service they were getting from folks like Comcast, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and said, fuck these guys, we're going to do our own. And <laughs> realizing that they had two choices, they could either 
do something to compete with the cities, or they could bribe the government officials with campaign contributions to block the cities from doing this. Naturally, since it was cheaper to bribe your elected officials, they bribed the elected officials, and laws were passed in a number of states. I think Pennsylvania is another one that says no city can put in their own broadband network. Even if the, that broadband network would not be a direct competitor with the services provided by somebody like Comcast or whatever. Uh, Chattanooga managed to to slip in and do it before the uh, <clears throat> um, whatever the fuck the, before that law got passed in Tennessee, but they're the only city in Tennessee that I know of that has done that. And you know, it's really stupid that the cable companies have done this. I, I, you know, I supposedly have like 10 up and 10 down or 30 up and 10 down. I don't remember what, but let's say hypothetically that my city said, all right, we're going to do a, our own system. And everybody who wants it is going to be able to use it. You'll get five up and five down or, you know, five up and two down. Okay. Not great, but still good enough for things like streaming video, et cetera, et cetera. And it wouldn't compete with AT&T and those guys. And it might actively encourage people who don't currently have high speed internet to get it because they could try out the free version and say, wow, this is pretty cool. I wish it was faster. Well, you know, you pay X amount of dollars and you get a faster version. Hey, let me call the AT&T or Comcast or whomever. Uh, but no, we can't do that because we're, you know, American exceptionalism, i.e. we're exceptionally stupid. The UK, from what I understand, has a great system in that the government went out, wired everybody up, and then says, okay, now these private companies are, you know, they'll be your provider and you get, you know, you pick whichever one you want to, to provide you access and things like that. So it, it, it's like... Another way to look at it is the government there in the UK built the roads and you hire the taxi company to take you wherever you want to go on those roads. That's how to look at it. We can't do anything like that here because Jeebus or whatever. It irritates the piss out of me. And Google was supposed to come in and wire in Nashville and now they've kind of backed off about that with putting fiber everywhere. And it's, you know, it's holding back economic growth in all these areas. I mean, Nashville would be a perfect place for high speed internet because we, we are a minor nexus of Hollywood. I mean, we have the, the, you know, they do the Nashville TV series here and other TV shows are shot here. So having easy access to high speed internet connections would encourage more television production here, more movies to be shot here. Uh, you also could have, you know, uh, a lot more music produced here because, hey, you've got faster pipe that they can do. Uh, it's, I know, like, back. Well, I, I know a number of musicians have gotten to get, who's, you know, been in a situation where they wanted to record together, but they couldn't work out a time where they all could be in the same studio together. So because they had access to high speed internet connections, they set, you know, each one of them set up in a different city in a studio with one of those high speed internet connections and did it that way. So, I mean, you couldn't have somebody recording in a studio in New York and Los Angeles at the same time because the lag the, and, and the distance between those two ends of the country is too great. But you could certainly have, you know, an artist in, in Nashville and an artist in Atlanta collaborating together. But no, we can't do that. Makes me angry. And God damn it, I want my porn as fast as I can get it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Democracy simply doesn't work. This story comes from the New York Times.com. Trump removes Stephen Bannon from National Security Council post. 
For the first 10 weeks of President Trump's administration, no advisor loomed larger in the public imagination than Stephen K. Bannon, the raw and rumbled former chairman of Breitbart News, who considers himself a virulently anti-establishment revolutionary out to destroy the administrative state. Yeah, that's a nice guy. But behind the scenes, White House officials said the ideologist who enjoyed the president's confidence became increasingly embattled as other advisors, including Mr. Trump's daughter and son-in-law, complained about setbacks on health care and immigration. Lately, Mr. Bannon has been conspicuously absent from some meetings, and now he has lost his seat at the national security table. In a move that was widely seen as a sign of changing fortunes, Mr. Trump removed Mr. Bannon, his chief strategist, from the National Security Council's cabinet-level principals committee on Wednesday. The shift was orchestrated by Lieutenant H.R. McMaster, Mr. Trump's national security advisor, who insisted on purging a political advisor from the Situation Room where decisions about war and peace are made. However, I want to point out that he, that Bannon was in the Situation Room when they were watching the cruise missiles being launched against that airfield in Syria the other day. Mr. Bannon resisted the move, even threatening at one point to quit if it went forward, according to a White House House official who, like others, insisted on anonymity to discuss internal deliberations. Mr. Bannon's camp denied that he had threatened to resign and spent the day spreading the word that the shift was a natural evolution, not a signal of any diminution of his outsized influence. His allies said privately that Mr. Bannon had been put on the Principals Committee to keep an eye on Mr. Trump's first national security advisor, Michael T. Flynn, a retired three-star general who lasted just 24 days before being forced out for misleading Vice President Mike Pence and other White House officials about what he had discussed with Russia's ambassador. With Mr. Flynn gone, these allies said there was no need for Mr. Bannon to remain, but they noted that he had kept his security clearance. Now! My question is, why the fuck would you put somebody like Flynn on the National Security Council if you thought he needed a babysitter? You know, (laughs) what what, what the hell was the point of that? Now, supposedly the reason why Trump picked Flynn to be on the National Security Council, even though he apparently didn't trust him, is that Flynn early on in Trump's campaign was a big supporter. So this was his reward. But none of it makes any sense, really. It really doesn't. Because Trump, you know, the rumor is that the scandal which caused Flynn to get outed is a bullshit scandal as everything that... It was a bullshit scandal because actually Trump and company knew all that stuff. It was that it hadn't been made public to anybody else outside the administration. I don't know if that's true or not, but it just... It does not put the administration in a good light. And I also need to point out that in addition to Bannon being tossed, KT McFarland has been tossed as well. Now, who is she besides somebody else on the National Security Council? She's a former Fox News commentator. Why the fuck would you have a former television personality on the National Security Council? Of course, now that I say that, I realize, why the fuck would you have a former television personality as your president? Because we're a nation of dumbasses, that's why. So, we'll see what happens with that. They've put the heads of the Joint Chiefs back on the National Security Council as well, so maybe saner heads are prevailing. I doubt it, though. This story comes from Politico.com. Pence's Obamacare diplomacy fails to yield a deal. Conservatives and moderates say they heard two different things from the White House. The White House's latest last-ditch effort to save the GOP's Obamacare replacement bill hit a brick wall Tuesday night as conservative and moderate Republicans met and realized they had two very different understandings of the changes sought by top Trump officials. Conservatives in the White House Freedom Caucus, 
It's like the Ministry of Information or the Ministry of Love. Say, Vice President Mike Pence, Chief of Staff Rince Priebus, and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney sought to win their votes by offering a repeal of major Obamacare regulations during a Monday night meeting. But moderates who met with the same Trump official hours before were told the changes won't be as far-reaching. Hmm. The discrepancy in what was or was not promised became increasingly apparent throughout the day, Tuesday, according to multiple sources across the spectrum of the House Republican Conference. A late-night huddle with Pence and the leaders of all the GOP caucuses in the basement of the Capitol failed to clarify the issue, leaving Hill insiders speculating whether the White House offered two different potential deals or lawmakers selectively heard what they wanted. Mm, man, that uh, it's a, that's a real toss up there. Republicans plan to meet again Wednesday, but it is unclear whether th- where they go from here. It is also all but certain that the House won't be voting on a bill to replace the 2010 health care law before the two week Easter recess. Uh, Pelosi, however, is asking that they not go for the recess so that they can bitch about Trump launching his missile strike against Syria without telling Congress first. Even though he did inform the Russians. There were no agreements tonight in principle, and certainly no agreements in terms of a foundation, Freedom Caucus Chairman Mark Meadows said. One of the few members of the Freedom Caucus who admits their membership in it said Tuesday night while exiting the meeting. The North Carolina Republican said members had a good discussion, but he acknowledged that there's a whole lot of things we have to work out in terms of differences. Mm -hmm. You guys keep at that. And of course, everybody's forgotten this because of that missile strike. Mm -hmm. Coincidence? I think not. But I'm... While Trump certainly should have told Congress before he ordered the missile strike, informing the Russians wasn't a bad thing to do, seeing as how the Russians did have all their advisors and military hardware in the area. We want to let them know so that they don't get blown up and cause the situation to get worse. Of course, an intelligent person would realize, well, they're going to tell Assad and he's going to pull his shit out of there as well. So let's hit something besides just the runways and figure out a way to get that airfield totally out of operation if we can. That is certainly not the Trump administration's way, it seems. And while we're on the subject of the airfield, this comes from foxtrotalpha.jalopnik.com. Why firing Tomahawk missiles at Syria was a nearly useless response. The U.S. Navy has launched 59 Tomahawk land attack missiles at a Syrian military airfield Thursday night in retaliation for a Syrian chemical weapons attack on its own civilians earlier this week. But make no mistake that this is a political move, not a decisive military one. Tomahawks are not the ideal weapon to do long-term damage to an airfield runway, like the one that launched the planes implicated in the chemical attack. At approximately 8.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, should be Eastern Daylight Time, guys, 4.40 a.m. local time, missiles from the USS Porter and USS Ross began striking Sharat Air Base in central Syria. That's the air base that sortied the warplanes that carried out the chemical attack. Believed to be the nerve agent, Sarin, which killed or wounded over 100 people in the city of Khan Shikhun. The gas came despite the work of the United Nations to make sure Syrian President Bashir al-Assad had given them up entirely, which Assad claimed he did. Obviously, he did not. Or he knew how to make more. If a bunch of nut jobs in Japan can figure out how to make sarin gas, I'm sure Assad can do it as well. The American military warned Russia in advance of the pending missile strike using the established deconfliction communication line, according to a Pentagon statement. That's the infamous red phone that they had installed after the Cuban Missile Crisis. The strike was designed to minimize potential casualties among Russian and Syrian forces who may have been present at the airfield. At the same time, the American strikes avoided the ostensible object of their mission, the sarin itself, to further minimize potential Russian casualties. Hmm. Targets at Sharat Air Base, which is one of the largest 
and most active among the Syrian Air Force included aircraft, hardened aircraft shelters, fuel storage radars, ammunition storage, and air defense system. But no mention of runways, which should have been targeted to deny the use of the facility, even temporarily. The article goes on to talk about how tomahawks are terrible weapons if you want to take out an airfield or a runway because they explode on the surface and a couple of guys with a bulldozer and some dirt can patch the runway after such an attack. You want something that'll penetrate below the surface of the runway and then explode. Also, the Syrians are using Russian-built aircraft. Russia's game plan has always been to design their aircraft to be able to handle taking off from damaged runways. They always figured, eh, the Americans have better stuff, it'll get through our air defenses, so we need to, rather than trying to build better air defenses because we lack the necessary technology, let's build better aircraft that can handle things. There's uh, one of the Russian fighter planes, and I don't remember which MiG it is, they've got screens that go over that can be put in front of the engines to keep them from sucking up trash when they're taking off. Because the idea is they would, they would be taking off from bombed runways and there would be risk of trash getting sucked up into the engines. So <clears throat> they just put screens over the engines to keep the trash out. And they're movable. That was the thing I remember seeing about it is, um, Oh God, it's been like 20 years since I saw the program, but they, you know, they showed the fighter out there on the runway taxiing around and the guy demonstrating, you know, the sliding the grates back and forth in front of the intakes of the engines. Oh, okay. And a final note before I get out of here. If you do not listen to the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast, I have, I'll have a link in the show notes to it. Check out the episode from March 27th of this year, All Politics is Social and Other Observations. Now, the, the, if you're not familiar with the podcast, what it's about is Bruce Carlson takes an event from American history and compares it to similar events that are happening today. And he's he really tries to be objective in what he does. So he doesn't slant it saying, well, this is, you know... This party's evil because they did this, blah, 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 or anything like No, he tries to be objective. He tries to put everything in context. It is an excellent podcast. It's one of the best history podcasts I've ever heard, and I listen to a lot of them. But his this one episode that I'm talking about, he has his 14 points that are what the Democrats need to do in the upcoming elections in 2018 and 2020. It is incredibly insightful and accurate, in my opinion. He really understands what the party needs to do, how they need to get to a place where they can look at taking back the House, possibly the Senate, and the White House in 2020. And he, as I said, he, he tries to be objective and he gives a historical perspective on things. One of the things that he says is most presidents are reelected. And he lists since 1860 the number of U.S. presidents who have not been reelected. Very small number, like seven, I think. Anyways, the, the point he makes is don't, you know, the, the point he makes is, you know, if Trump is going to lose in 2020, it's most likely going to be related to things like the economy, and it's not necessarily going to be related to things like we're seeing now with the various scandals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It'll be the economy that gets it in all likelihood. There are, of course, exceptions, and it's entirely possible that Trump may not be running for president um, for whatever reason in 2020. As Carlson points out, it's too early to speculate what's going to happen with Trump by uh, in 2020, in terms of whether or not he'll be running for re-election, whether he gets impeached or resigns or primary, we just have to wait and see. Um, but he gives he gives a lot of the odds. He gives examples. It's a great podcast. Very, very well done. 
And it's just him talking. Occasionally he'll put out episodes where he's got a guest or somebody else on, but 99% of them are just him talking and going over a subject. And I've always, you know, I've been blown away by a number of the episodes that he's done because he'll pull something and you're, you know, from history and you're going, wait, this, you know, this happened? This, you know, this happened in, in, a, in American history. I've never heard of this. And as you're going along, you're like, wow, this isn't a minor deal. And I've never heard of this. How did I miss this? I, so, some of the things even happened in my lifetime. And it's like, wow, I don't remember that. Now, the one thing is, is if you're listening to this episode at some point in the distant future, Carlson keeps his episodes freely available for a short period of time. I'll say short because I think it's like a year or two. And then if you want to get access to the back catalog, you have to be a premium member. And I don't know what that costs. So if, you know, you're listening to this in 2018 or something like 2019, it may not, that link may not work. But if you're listening to it anytime in 2017, the link will almost certainly work. And, you know, again, it's one of the things that I, I hate to gush so much, but it is such a good podcast. There's one episode and sadly it's not available anymore. And it's one of the rare episodes where he reaches beyond American history to world history to discuss events happening in American history or in, in contemporary America. And it was uh, an episode about Neville Chamberlain and the whole issue with, you know, him being called the Umbrella Man and, you know, seeing as being a coward, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he does an excellent job of putting everything into perspective as to why Chamberlain would have been so reluctant to go to war with Germany in the 1930s. And he ties it in, as I recall, with the slanders against uh, JFK, because there were, I don't remember what JFK event it was, but there was, whether it was the Bay of Pigs or something, but people were referring to him as a new Chamberlain. There is a, in the Zap Ruder film, you can see a guy opening and closing an umbrella as JFK's limo goes by shortly before the shots ring out. And in interviews that the guy did, because despite what the conspiracy theorists say, the guy was interviewed shortly after that. And he said he was had the umbrella as a statement, you know, comparing Kennedy to Chamberlain, and he had no involvement with the assassination. But anyways, I urge you to check that out, that episode of the podcast out that I'll have the link to because it is so good. It is so insightful. And it's not just, hey, the Democrats need to do this. It's a good discussion of what Trump is doing and how Trump is controlling the discussion of the news cycle and why that is not a good thing and why it makes it likely he will be reelected unless the Democrats do something to counter that. And, you know, he... Bruce gives some suggestions, and I'm sure there's others that can be done as well, but he does give some really good suggestions. So uh, I urge you to check that out, and I will have that in the show notes so you guys can find it easily later on. That's it for this episode of The Atheist in the Trailer Park Podcast. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as just about anywhere else podcasts can be found. Many of the episodes are also on YouTube. Follow the show on Twitter. At T Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. It's on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash trailerparkatheist.com. If you happen to like the podcast, please rate it on iTunes. If you'd like to support the podcast, there's a donate button on the show notes page. You can support it via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash TN Tucker. Thanks for listening. Say goodnight, Fuzznuts. All I know is this violates every canon of respectable broadcasting. Damned cat. <laughs>